Okay, so thank you guys for joining us today. My name is Jerry Williams and I am the founder and president of Myositis Support and Understanding Association. Uh, we are, for those of you who aren't aware, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we work daily to improve the lives of and empower those fighting myositis. Joining me in uh, moderating today's webinar is Lynn Wilson and she is the vice president of Myositis Support and Understanding. And we both uh, have been diagnosed with dermatomyositis. So uh, before we uh, get to uh, the introduction for our very special guest today, I would just like to note uh, to locate the Q&A icon on your Zoom toolbar. If you have questions during the webinar uh, that you would like to ask, please click on that Q&A icon and you can type your question. Please note that Dr. Mammon will not be able to answer any uh, personal case history or um, answer those types of questions. Um, so, you know, just want to let you know that up front, not to, uh, to expect that. Um, I know sometimes we get very excited uh, to <laughs> talk to somebody as knowledgeable uh, as Dr. Mammon. So, um, so with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mammon. Um, Dr. Mammon <clears throat> is currently in the muscle disease, or excuse me, is a muscle disease unit leader in the laboratory of muscle stem cells and gen, uh, excuse me, gene regulation at the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, which is a part of the NIH. He co-founded the myositis, <clears throat> excuse me, the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center in 2007. Uh, he and his colleagues at Hopkins discovered a novel form of autoimmune <clears throat> myopathy associated with statin use and autoantibodies recognizing HMG CoA reductase, the pharmacological target of statins. In addition to clinical studies involving myositis patients, he, uh, excuse me, his current laboratory research interests include defining pathogenic mechanisms in the various forms of autoimmune myopathy and understanding the role of myositis autoantigens in muscle regeneration. Uh, today, he's here to talk to us about immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy um, and maybe a little bit about the uh, clinical trial um, that's uh, being run for that. So uh, without further ado, welcome, Dr. Mammon. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I, uh, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you guys about myositis and immune-mediated necrotizing myopathies. I've got a, a presentation I'll share with you. You know, I don't know how long it's going to run, maybe 20, 30 minutes, something like that. And um, I'm happy to take your questions afterwards. I think people usually get the most out of the question and answer uh, sessions. I don't want to take the whole time with me just uh, jibber jabbering away, but I, I'll share my um, talk here. Um, can you guys see now the, the talk? If I do this? Yes. Great. All right. Thank so you. the title of the talk is about immune mediated necrotizing myopathies, but I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, sort of putting this type of myositis in perspective um, in relationship to the other types of, of myositis you guys might have heard about. And you know, the way people have uh, over the years thought about myositis was basically thinking there are kind of two types of myositis. You either had polymyositis or you had dermatomyositis. And um, uh, these are sort of based on what we call the Bohan and Peter criteria, which were published by these really great doctors, Bohan and Peter, back in 1975. They've been super useful. And basically, they said, look, you've got polymyositis if you have symmetric proximal muscle weakness, so difficulty getting up out of a chair, difficulty raising your arms above your head, as opposed to distal weakness, like if your finger flexors are weak. Muscle enzymes, like the CK, should be elevated. When you do the EMG or electromyography, you should see features that are typical for muscle disease or, or myopathy. Um, and in patients who undergo a muscle biopsy, what you'd expect to see is inflammation and muscle cell death. So you get the uh, white blood cells that are usually in the blood actually infiltrating the muscle where they don't belong. And then you also see you know, cell death, which you're not supposed to see. Now, dermatomyositis was distinguished from polymyositis just on the basis of characteristic rashes. So if you didn't have the rash, you had polymyositis. If you had the rash, you had dermatomyositis. And these are the kind of typical dermatomyositis rashes that I think most of you are familiar with. This is the classic sort of heliotrope rash, which is this erythema over the upper eyelids um, of a patient. And then on the right, Gotrin's papules, which are these uh, erythematous lesions over the knuckles and uh, finger joints. 
um, which you can see here. And again, you know, the only we only really thought of there as being dermatomyositis, not different types of dermatomyositis, and then polymyositis. I think we're moving more towards um, having a little bit more of a sophisticated way of dividing up the different types of myositis. And it's based uh, in part on the presence of autoantibodies. So, you know, antibodies, as most people know, are made by the body to protect us against viruses and bacteria, foreign invaders. Um, those are antibodies. Autoantibodies are antibodies that are sort of misdirected towards our own tissues. And so there are, I don't know, eight or 10 different major um, autoantibodies in patients with myositis. There are patient, there are autoantibodies that are specifically associated with dermatomyositis um, against uh, different uh, proteins that you might have heard of that I'm not going to go into detail about here. And then some dermatomyositis patients, maybe a third, don't have a known uh, dermatomyositis autoantibody. Um, and again, these patients have usually skin and muscle disease. There's this other form of myositis called the antisynthetase syndrome. And it's called that because uh, this, ant this JO1 autoantibody recognizes something called a synthetase, and as do these other antibodies, uh, PL7, PL12, and so on. And patients with these autoantibodies have the antisynthetase syndrome, and they don't just have myositis, they don't just have skin disease, they often also will have uh, arthritis and or interstitial lung disease. And a lot of these uh, folks, it's really the lung involvement that's, the, that's their major problem. Um, uh, I could talk all day about inclusion body myositis. I'm not gonna talk very much about that uh, today as part of this talk. But what I do wanna spend a lot of time talking about is this fourth type of myositis that we now recognize called immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Immune-mediated, meaning it's autoimmune. Necrotizing, meaning the muscle biopsies have a lot of muscle cell death, a lot of necrosis and myopathy because it's a muscle disease. Um, and there are three types, there are two types of antibodies that are associated with um, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. The first is SRP, which stands for signal recognition particle, which is part of the machinery that makes uh, protein for every cell in our body. And then there are antibodies against HMGCR, which stands for HMG-CoA reductase, which helps build cholesterol. Um, so autoantibodies against each of these are associated with um, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, also called necrotizing myositis, or the abbreviation uh, IMNM, or sometimes NAM for necrotizing autoimmune myositis. And then there are some patients who have necrotizing muscle biopsies and appear to have an immune-mediated disease, but don't have antibodies recognizing SRP or HMGCR. And these patients are called antibody negative IM and M patients. And I'll talk mostly about SRP and HMGCR patients um, because we don't know that much about the antibody negative necrotizing myositis patients. They are probably uh, a mix of different types of patients um, and we just don't understand them as well. Uh, some of you may ask, well, what happened to the term polymyositis? Um, well, most of us now who would have previously given a diagnosis of polymyositis would now be happier making kind of a more specific diagnosis. So some patients who used to be thought to have polymyositis have inclusion body myositis. Um, we can recognize them because most of them have finger flexor weakness, which we don't see much in our other types of myositis. Um, and then, uh, you know, patients with immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy 10 or 20 years ago would have been called polymyositis. Uh, also, if you have the antisynthetase syndrome with JO1 antibodies, for example, and you don't have a rash, you would have been called polymyositis before, but now we just call you antisynthetase syndrome. And then now that we're better at uh, doing gene testing, we recognize that some patients that we used to think had polymyositis really have genetic muscle disease. And it's important to know that if that's the case, because those inherited muscle diseases are not well treated with immunosuppressive agents like we use for patients with autoimmune muscle disease. So just to give you a flavor that these different types of myositis have different looking muscle biopsies, I'm showing you uh, uh, pictures of the different muscle biopsies. I'm realizing I should have thrown a picture of normal muscle in here, but what I can tell you is that the dermatomyositis and antisynthetase uh, patients have a lot of inflammation. Those little dark purple dots in here, those, uh, those little dots don't belong here. Those are infiltrating white blood cells that are probably part of the immune response doing damage uh, to the muscle. Um, this 
uh, is what an IBM muscle biopsy looks like. Some of you might have heard of rimmed vacuoles. Well, here's a little rimmed vacuole um, inside of a, um, of a muscle fiber. And then in the middle here is a picture of a muscle biopsy from patients with immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. And what you see is we find that there are a lot of dying cells, a lot of cells that are regenerating. Fortunately, muscle, after it's damaged, uh, unlike a lot of tissues, can regenerate. But we don't see a lot, nearly as many of those dark uh, purple dots that are infiltrating um, white blood cells. We don't think that the white blood cells are you know, major part of what's doing the direct damage to the muscle tissue. So recently, um, these three different types of immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy have been defined. Um, and uh, another word for um, IMNM with anti-HMGCR antibodies is just, we call it now sometimes, some of us, anti-HMGCR myopathy. And we can pretty much diagnose patients with anti-HMGCR myopathy if they have weakness in the right pattern, proximal muscle weakness, and they have muscle enzymes that are elevated, like the CK, ICK, and they have that autoantibody against HMGCR. If you have those things, we can pretty much define you as having anti-HMGCR myopathy. And most of you will probably notice uh, EMG and muscle biopsy are not required to make that diagnosis. And I think that's kind of the direction that we're, we're moving in patients with an antibody. Um, we don't really require the muscle biopsy. Similarly, for patients with anti-SRP myopathy, if they have weakness, high CK, and the right autoantibody, they've pretty much got that disease. And we don't really find it necessary to have particular muscle biopsy findings that, that go along with that. And then you've got the antibody negative immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy at the bottom. Those patients look the same, except they don't have myositis-specific autoantibodies. And so to make the diagnosis, you do have to do a muscle biopsy. And that muscle biopsy has to show lots of muscle fiber death without a lot of white blood cells infiltrating the muscle, like you'd see in some of the other forms of myositis. So those are the three different types of um, IMNM. Um, Anti-SRP was one of the very first myositis autoantibodies that was ever uh, discovered. And it was recognized fairly early on that these patients, like I said, have a necrotizing muscle biopsy. Another thing that's fairly typical is uh, the severity of disease experienced by patients with anti-SRP autoantibodies. Many times they have rapidly progressive weakness that really over weeks or months can make people very weak. They tend to have very high CK levels. If you think uh, and the average CK level for somebody is maybe around 200. Well, the average CK level for somebody who has anti-SRP myopathy untreated is close to 10,000, some people even higher. Now, although anti-SRP necrotizing myositis patients usually have um, muscle involvement as the primary manifestation, some patients, maybe around 20%, do have some low level of interstitial lung disease like we see in the antisynthetase patients, but it tends not to be a big problem for those patients um, and is uh, usually really easily treated compared to the muscle disease, which is often among the most difficult to treat. The other thing I would mention is unlike most of our other myositis patients, we do occasionally see cardiac involvement in anti-SRP patients. So cardiomyopathy um, can occur in maybe 10 to 15% of patients with anti-SRP myopathy. So that is, um, that is how that disease looks. Again, very minimal, uh, minimally, only, only very infrequently do patients have skin involvement or other really significant organ system involvement. <clears throat> Anti-HMGCR positive myopathy patients have very similar necrotizing muscle biopsies. One of the key things that distinguishes them is that we know that statin exposure seems to be a risk factor for developing anti-HMGCR myopathy. And about 70% of our patient population have been exposed to statins. Actually, if you look at the older group, which I think I'm, uh, yeah, is patients over the age of 50, um, you know, more than 90% of them have had a statin exposure. There are some younger patients, younger than 40, uh, and only about a third of them have had statin exposure. So you don't have to have a statin exposure to get this disease, but it's definitely a risk factor. And one of the key things is that this disease progresses despite discontinuing the statin. So statins, you give them, many people will develop some minor muscle problems or maybe even severe muscle problems that go away when you stop the drug. But patients with anti-HMGCR myositis 
their weakness just keeps on going despite stopping those, those lipid lowering drugs. Almost everybody's weak and has muscle pain. Their CKs are also super high, nearly 10,000. And they have even fewer uh, non-skeletal muscle uh, organ system involvement uh, than the anti-SRP patients. So usually it's just predominantly muscle, no heart, no lung, uh, no skin. Um, so they're a little bit different than SRP. Um, and another important thing is if somebody develops this disease and you give them a statin, uh, that is likely to cause a disease flare. So we like to avoid um, treating patients with statins who have anti-atrium GCR myopathy. Uh, this is a study that was done by some of my colleagues at Hopkins, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, it shows that not all statins are e seem to be equally likely to cause uh, anti-HM GCR myopathy or to trigger it. Um, atorvastatin, which is otherwise known as Lipitor, um, seems to um, be more prone to doing so, although this is just a single study and that really needs to be um, reproduced in, in other cohorts as well. Um, the other thing is that many of our patients with anti-HM GCR myopathy also have type 2 diabetes uh, and they developed it early before they were ever given steroids or anything like that. So for reasons we don't understand, type 2 diabetes and Lipitor or Torvastatin seem to be um, associated with um, developing this disease. So in the past couple of years, we've developed some treatment guidelines um, for how we treat patients with both anti-SRP and anti-HMGCR. Um, I don't think it's important to look at all this uh, stuff on the left. Um, I'll, to, I can simplify by saying, we basically treat, recommend treating patients with steroids and then adding another agent like methotrexate. Um, and almost everybody requires um, at least steroids and another agent to begin with. And in patients who have severe um, disease, or um, I think even you know nowadays we're using it even earlier than we used to for patients with anti-SRP, we use a drug called rituximab. I've, um, I called it RTX here, but that stands for rituximab. And we tend to now use that early in the course of disease in patients who have anti-SRP myopathy. Similarly, in patients with anti-HMGCR autoantibodies, uh, we found that IVIG tends to be very effective for those patients. So uh, sometimes, uh, especially in patients who can't um, tolerate prednisone because they have diabetes, um, we will sometimes use um, IVIG early and sometimes in, instead of using corticosteroids at all. And in fact, we published a paper of just a few cases where uh, these were anti-HMGCR positive patients who had progressive weakness despite stopping statins with very high CK levels that didn't really want to go on, on steroids because they had diabetes. And so instead we initiated just IVIG as monotherapy. And um, these patients got a lot better and most of them had their disease um, under perfect or near perfect control just with IVIG. Um, so uh, I tend to like using this, this drug uh, early and, um, and try to get the disease under control as quickly as possible. Another thing I thought I'd mention since we're talking about anti-HMGCR myopathy is that, in, as I mentioned, you can't really restart a statin in these patients. So what do we do uh, for patients who still have problems with high cholesterol? Well, it turns out there's a new class of uh, lipid lowering agents called PCSK9 in inhibitors. And these drugs um, appear to be safe and well tolerated in patients with anti-HMGCR myopathy. And so this is a paper looking at eight patients who have anti-HM GCR myopathy were started on PCSK9 inhibitors for their persistent high cholesterol. And they were followed for an average of a year and a half. And they did not appear to suffer any adverse consequences of being on those medications. And they all had good uh, lipid uh, profile control as well. So just uh, a little bit about managing cholesterol. Now, I talked about how we treat patients with IMNM. And a lot of times we have decent success with the current therapies, you know, steroids, something like methotrexate, azathioprine, IVIG, rituximab, and patients uh, get better. But this is a graph over time showing how patients' um, strength uh, starts off kind of low with either antisynthetase syndrome or dermatomyositis and then, uh, whoop, and then gets uh, better um, over time. Those are the upper two lines. However, the patients with immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy start off weaker, 
strength of seven out of 10 instead of eight or nine out of 10. And they do get better over the first couple of years on average, but then they start to go downhill again. Um, some of the patients we have trouble getting under good control. So um, I would say this, this line sort of combines patients who have with IM and M who have very, both very good outcomes and those who have progressive disease where we have a difficult time controlling it. So I'll just show you a little more information about why um, we need better treatments for IM and M. And so this is looking at how patients uh, on the left here with anti-HMGCR myopathy did with our usual treatments um, over the course of two years. So out of 50 anti-HMGCR patients that we followed for more than two years, only 22 got back to being full strength. Uh, these tended to be older patients, age 56 or older. Um, and out of those 22, it wasn't like people got entirely off of medications. 19 of them still required immunosuppressive therapy or IVIG. And out of those 22, more than half continued to have CK levels over 500, which is at least double normal, indicating that even though they've got their full strength back, there's still evidence of active disease. Now that, that's not that concerning. What's more concerning is that out of the 50 patients, 15 of them really did not have good control of their disease. With, they continued to get weaker, their CK levels were nearly 1500. Um, and interestingly, these tended to be our younger patients. So the mean age at onset was only 48 years in those patients compared to the slightly older patients who got better. So younger patients have more severe disease, harder to treat. And um, boy, we need better treatments for those patients who just aren't responding. And it's really the same story for anti-SRP. Out of 21 patients followed for um, two years or more, um, 10 of them reached um, at least eight out of 10 strength. That's not full strength. That's better, but not full. Only one could be tapered off medications. Four of them still had evidence of active disease because their CKs were high. And more than, you know, more than half of the anti-SRP patients continued to have really significant weakness. So, you know, bottom line is we need better treatments for immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. So now I want to talk about what we think causes muscle damage in patients with IM and M. And we think it is um, a process called antibody-mediated complement-dependent cytotoxicity, which means that antibodies are um, mediating this, that there's, uh, and then it, they're activating something called complement, which kills the muscle cells. And I just will review a little bit about this pathway, not going to any uh, deep detail, but just to give you a flavor of what this um, cell death mechanism is. So this is the normal situation. That is that antibodies, which are floating around in the blood, can bind to the surface of a bacteria. These proteins that are also floating around in the blood called complement get activated by the antibodies. And the, and the complement actually creates a pore or hole in the membrane of the, the cell surface of the bacteria that causes the cell to die. So um, basically the complement is there to... Um, to kill cells that antibodies are binding to. So that is, the, um, uh, that is how complement gets activated by the antibodies and forms these holes and gets rid of foreign invaders. And, and we like that, that's a good thing. But autoantibodies can bind to muscle cells and we think it can activate complement and create a hole in the muscle cell that kills the muscle cells. So that's kind of the theory for what's causing the actual muscle damage in patients who have these autoantibodies against the SRP or HMGCR proteins. And, and why do we think this? What's the evidence that these antibodies kill muscle cells by this complement mediated mechanism? Well, the first is unlike other types of myositis, there are just very few inflammatory cells in the muscle tissue itself. So something else must be doing the damage. We also know that the higher the antibody levels are in the blood of patients with these diseases, the weaker patients are and the, and the more muscle damage that's occurring based on them having higher CK levels. So the antibody levels go along with the amount of muscle damage. May I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think it's just important for, for those that are watching to um, maybe understand that with other autoantibodies, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, that's a good point. We don't. We actually don't know if it's if that is the case or not. It uh, 
for a lot of them. And we could talk about each of the different types, but you're absolutely right. The, the evidence that, um, that the antibodies are causing the muscle damage seems to really be strongest for this type of myositis, the necrotizing myositis with SRP or HMGCR antibodies. So thanks for um, emphasizing that. that is a, that's an important point. Great, thank you. Yeah, and so um, one reason, you know, the other reason we think that this may be a complement mediated process is if you look at the muscle biopsies um, of patients with anti-SRP or anti-HMGCR uh, myopathy, on the surface of the muscle cells, here you can say, see sort of stained in brown around the edges of a couple of these fibers, you can see complement. So there's complement there actually on the muscle fibers. And the more complement that you find on the muscle fibers, the more cell death you see. So the more complement, the more fibers that are decorated with complement, the more dead fibers they are. So those two things go together. But the really, I think, most exciting evidence uh, that these autoantibodies actually cause the disease, cause weakness in muscle cell death, comes out of the lab of some of our colleagues in France, by a guy named uh, Olivier Boyer, who's done this really great work along with uh, his colleague in Paris, Olivier Bonvenis. What they did was they took antibodies from anti hngcr and anti-SRP patients, took these antibodies and injected them into mice. And what they found was that if you inject either anti-HMGCR or anti-SRP autoantibodies into mice, they cause muscle weakness. I won't go through the details of that experiment, but that's sort of the bottom line. And if you look at the muscle tissue, you can see that the antibodies are associated with not just weakness, but also muscle cell necrosis or muscle cell death. So they seem to be in these mice causing um, the weakness and the damage. And, and, and they also did a very cool experiment where they used mice that don't have a complement. They just don't make complement. They're complement deficient mice. And if you inject these mice with these anti-HMGCR, anti-SRP antibodies, you don't get the same weakness and muscle cell necrosis, which indicates that the complement has to be there in order for the antibodies to do uh, their job. So, um, all of that, put that, all that together, and it really suggests that anti-SRP and anti-HMGCR myopathy are, uh, are caused by the antibodies binding to the surface of muscle cells, activating complement, complement poking holes in the muscle and killing the muscle, making people weak, making their CK levels go up. So if muscle cell death and weakness are caused by complement activation, by antibodies activating complement, how can we stop this? And that's where um, this really exciting new class of medication comes in called complement inhibitors, um, which uh, weren't originally designed for, for, for necrotizing myositis, but I think they're going to potentially be useful in patients who have um, myositis. So the drug that is currently being used in a clinical trial for myositis has already been used. Um, it's called Xylucoplan. It's a complement inhibitor. It's already been really shown to be safe and effective for another autoimmune disease um, that's a neuromuscular disease called myasthenia gravis. This is a, a recent publication showing um, the results in, in that disease. And now um, we're moving forward doing a clinical trial with the same medication, similar doses or same doses um, in patients with immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. So Ra uh, Pharma started this uh, trial now uh, um, uh, part of UCB. And, and this is a clinical trial of their complement inhibitor called Xylucoplan for necrotizing myositis. And this is a drug that is given subcutaneously once a day. Um, for the trial, uh, patients are going to be divided into either getting the drug itself, Xylucoplan or placebo for eight weeks. Um, at the end of the eight weeks, we're going to look at the before and after CK level to see whether the patients who got Xylucoplan, whether their CKs came down. That'll be our primary outcome measure. Of course, we'll also be looking at strength and, and other things. And then another, I think, neat thing about this uh, trial design is after the eight weeks, um, everybody um, has the opportunity to go on Xylucoplan. So even if for patients who got placebo for the first eight weeks, they could then convert over to getting Xylucoplan um, in the extension phase of this. And um, we're 
uh, one of the unique things about this trial is we're only enrolling patients who have IMNM. Uh, you have to have anti-SRP or anti-HMGCR antibodies to, to enroll. We've got, this is just another uh, sort of schematic slide that describes the trial. And again, we're including um, patients with uh, IMNM, with SRP or HMGCR antibodies. To be eligible for this trial, patients need to be weak because the, we really wanted um, only patients who likely to get some benefit from being in the trial to be part of it. CK levels have to be over 1,000, showing us that there's active disease activity. And then patients have to be on stable doses of their other drugs like corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, and IVIG um, during, during, the, uh, during the eight weeks of the trial and beyond because we, we want everything else to be the same during this time period. And the only thing that changes is whether people go on the Zyluka plan or not. One thing I should mention is that the complement system, as I said, is there to get rid of bacteria. And there's a type of bacteria that causes uh, meningitis called meningococcus. And that uh, disease can be worse and we can be more susceptible to it if we don't have complement. So everybody joining the trial has to be vaccinated um, against meningitis. And then we're looking at a lot of different um, endpoints, basically strength and other measures of disease activity. But the primary outcome measure is the muscle enzyme level that we're going to look at uh, before and after the eight-week period. And uh, of course, what everybody's hoping to see is that the patients who got Plan have CKs that go down um, compared to those who got placebo. And then hopefully everybody um, or some portion of patients get better in the extension phase when they're able to stay on Plan. I did put a slide in here that has sort of more details about who is eligible to be in the study and who is not. I'm not going to go through that in super uh, detail now, but happy to answer questions about it um, if you have any. Um, and then I also just wanted to, to direct you to my email. So if you have any interest in this uh, trial or you have other questions about IMNM or myositis or the trial, this is my email. It's publicly available. It's just andrew.mammon at nih.gov. And um, I'm always happy to um, do the best I can to um, answer questions that people might have. And uh, I can do that also right now if you have questions available for me right now. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and um, you know, be available to answer any questions anybody might have. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Dr. Mammon. What a fascinating presentation. Uh, and information. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, several questions. And, okay. Uh, the first one, uh, why does the anti-HMGCR autoantibody bind to muscle surface? The HMGCR co-reductase is found mainly in the cytoplasm, so why does it bind to the muscle surface? Yeah, that is an a excellent question, <laughs> a very good question we ask ourselves as well. So um, <laughs> one thing that is... Um, uh, was a little surprising is that if you uh, take muscle cells and you look to see where HMGCR and SRP on muscle cells, it appears to be that those proteins are actually at or near the surface, which is not what we usually think of being the localization of the HMGCR and SRP proteins in other types of cells. So it may be actually on the surface in, in, uh, in muscle cells. And the other thing mm -hmm we do know is that if you like culture muscle cells in a Petri dish and add the antibody, you can see that it binds. So another possibility um, is that the antibodies recognize something that looks like HMGCR or SRP on the surface, but it might not be the same protein that's on the inside of the cell. That, those are excellent questions that um, I wish I had the definitive answer for, but it's one that comes up all the time by savvy um, listeners. <laughs> well, thank you for <laughs> taking the time to answer it. It is a very interesting question. Um, the next question, if CK levels are back under 200 with IVIG only, is difficulty getting up from a low chair the result of early muscle death? Yeah, so the, um, so some, so I, the, the, the sort of gen, more general question I think would be, if you continue to have weakness, but your CK is normal, what does that mean? So um, there are a couple possibilities. Um, I would say for, it could be that early on, the CK can normalize before the muscle has regenerated. So people can 
continue to be weak early on, even with a normal CK, because their muscles are still regenerating, they're still getting their strength back. Another possibility is that uh, the muscles have actually been permanently damaged by the disease process, and patients can get what's called fibrosis or fatty replacement of the muscle. And that's something that we can't, re we don't at least yet know how to reverse with the kinds of therapies that, that we have. So, um, so and, and often that process does occur early. That is like during the first six months to a year of a patient's disease when it tends to be less well controlled, that's when that fibrosis or fatty replacement um, can occur. And this is one of the reasons why we need to have the, we want to have the CK levels high um, not in the patients who are joining this trial. They're not just weak, but they also have high CK levels because that really tells us the disease is still active and the weakness isn't there um, because of permanent muscle damage that Zylucoplan or any other drug is not going to, is not going to help with. Great. Excellent. Um, kind of rewording of that question because yes, I, I know that I have read about, you know, there's a, there can be a delay between the treatment and when you actually, are, you know, get stronger. Um, and then like you mentioned the, you know, the potential for that, um, that damage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of along the same lines, but, um, Amanda has the uh, HMGCR for over 20 years, still very weak. Um, do, do you think in those cases, in a case like that, that the muscles have been um, damaged beyond recovery? Is there a way to, to test for that? Does an yes. MRI? Oh, very good. So you're, you're hired. That's exactly what's going to be my <laughs> answer. MRI was going to be my answer. Because um, some people, if people have had the disease for a long period of time and they've had significant uh, fibrosis or fatty replacement. Uh, they could still have active disease, but not a high CK level because they don't have enough muscle to actually release enough CK to make it go above normal or what we typically think of as, as normal. So if we see somebody who's weak and they have a normal CK, then MRI is often a good way to figure out whether they have active disease that we might want to be more aggressively treat or whether, you know, the disease is well controlled, but unfortunately there's just permanent muscle damage uh, that's left them, left them weak. But yeah, MRI would be my answer to that. And again, I would, uh, uh, it's important that I emphasize that all of these answers are really specific to necrotizing myositis, not other types of myositis. Right. And thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, uh, do you know, right offhand what the minimum age for the Zyalucoplan phase two trial is? I believe it's 18. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hope I'm not lying about that. I think it's 18. <laughs> uh, we'll provide some information yeah, yeah. in that section as well. Uh, so people can definitely go out and check that out on the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, are you aware, I, I don't know that phase three is uh, even been considered yet, uh, but do you know if CK will be um, a factor in the phase three trial as well? I don't. I think so. One of the reasons for doing a phase two trial is to figure out what are the best uh, measures um, to, to, to demonstrate that patients have, have improved. So um, uh, that remains to be seen. I mean, first, let's, let's hope we get a good uh, benefit um, or, or at least a signal that there's benefit in the phase two trial. But, um, you know, I would guess that the CK will be part of it, um, but that really remains to be seen. Great. Yeah, kind of see what the information shows from this trial. Yeah, that's that you, you use the phase two trials to help you design a smarter phase three trial. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. And thanks for the question. Uh, in, in your opinion, um, yeah. keeping in mind this is not medical advice um, or forward thinking, making statements, do you think Zylucoplan will be effective uh, for those with uh, immune mediated necrotizing myopathy to reduce weakness where the CK uh, might be lower than 1,000? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So if Zylucoplan is effective in patients who have CKs over 1,000, I don't have any reason to think that it wouldn't be effective and people have CKs under a thousand. Um, so I think, uh, you know, this is very forward thinking, but let's just say Zylucoplan worked like gangbusters and got approved. 
for patients with necrotizing myositis, there's no reason to think it would only be for those people with CKs over 1,000, like are included in the trial. Um, that would be my sense, although I, you know, sure, it's a prediction. Right. <laughs> Not a not a betting man, right? Not a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you do you recall when the uh, clinical trial fully enrolls for the phase two? Um, it's twenty four patients is 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 what they're we're hoping to, uh, or is it sixteen? I always forget patients. It's either sixteen or twenty four in the phase two. Um, so we're in the process of still enrolling. Great. So people, uh, anybody that's interested, you know, that meets the criteria and, you know, read about it, learn about the trial. Send us an email. We're, we're happy to answer questions about it. There's NIH is not the only site. Um, there are various sites. I didn't put a list of them, but um, you can either find that on the, um, the clinicaltrials.gov website, or um, we're happy to provide you with that information as well. That's very helpful uh, because without, you, uh, us as patients uh, that meet these criteria and are willing to uh, do these clinical trials, you know, we, we won't make any progress without you. So you're making a, uh, a big contribution. We definitely, uh, you know, are actively recruiting for this trial. That's great. Thank you. And um, this isn't really related to this. And if you can't answer it, that's fine. Um, whenever a vaccine is FDA approved, um, I assume talking about COVID, uh, is FDA approved, are there any reasons uh, as myositis patients we should not take it as soon as it's offered? Yeah, I don't really have a good answer to that, to be honest with you. I'm not, a, I'm not a vaccine expert, and B, I think any answer to that would depend on a lot of individual factors. Right. Um, so I think that's one I can't really answer in a general way. No worries. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to it. That uh, seems to be about all the questions uh, that have been submitted so far anyway. Um, sure. I would just like to ask a question, and this yeah. might just be um, kind of, I don't know. The HMGCR uh, autoantibody, since uh, that's something that is you know, a part of us, is that something that can be passed down? Oh, that's a good question. So we have looked to see, so we've never found two people in the same family who have it. I don't know if that is the best way to answer your question. So there, pro there, there are genetic risk factors. There's a specific genetic risk factor for developing the disease. And 70% um, of people who have the disease have this genetic risk factor but 20% of the rest of the population have it also. So, you know, 20% of people who are given a statin, for example, have that genetic risk factor, but only one out of 20,000 of them or something are gonna develop uh, the disease. So we don't, we're not able to predict who is uh, most vulnerable and we've never seen it in, in more than one person in the same family. In fact, like if we see people who, Whenever we see more than one person in the family who has myositis, our number one thought is this has got to be a genetic muscle disease until proven otherwise. Right. I'm sure. It's like, whoa, hold, yeah, yeah. hold everything. <laughs> it's not true with other things like that are more other um, autoimmune diseases that are more common. You know, lupus, for example, or rheumatoid arthritis, those diseases, you know, you might find people in the same family uh, who, sh who, sh who share those diseases. But uh, myositis is so rare that it's uh, very unlikely. And if I could just take a minute to ask about uh, statins in particular, because of some of the information uh, that gets posted around and, you know, yeah. people have different types of myositis. Um, you know, there was an article about the um, statins causing, uh, potentially causing this, um, yeah. you know, people start thinking, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't take a statin, um, but they might, have a different form of myositis, or they might be um, a family member of somebody that has this, and they're thinking, my, like my question previous, yeah. is <clears throat> is there uh, a gen? I guess like a general blanket type statement for those that are living with myositis. Should, yeah. should they all? Should we all avoid statins? No, that's a that's a really important question. So the um, the it 
I would say pretty much definitively, if you have anti-HMGCR, I would avoid statins. For all the other types of myositis, we don't have any evidence that statins make the disease worse or are going to like trigger a flare. There's no good data for that. Um, and if you, if patients who have the need for a lipid lowering agent, we have no problem with those patients going on statins. What I would say is that we're pretty cautious about monitoring how people do just maybe out of an abundance of caution, you know, we'll just want to make sure that, um, you know, in the initial couple months after people start a statin, that there's not some dramatic change in their, in their muscle disease. And, you know, that can happen to anyone, not just patients with myositis. So um, to the best of our knowledge, the myositis patients are at the same risk, although maybe, you know, you think maybe they're a little more vulnerable. We just don't see it that much. So the answer is don't be afraid of statins, but just be, be, um, uh, be aware that you're on something that could have a muscle side effect and just, and we're just on the lookout for it. And, and we can always stop it and use something else if need be. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and just one more question is yeah, plasma, sure. would plasma exchange be an effective option for uh, HMGCR myopathy? Yeah, you'd think it would be. And they use it in Europe a fair amount. Um, we've had sort of good, pretty good luck with IVIG, which is, seems to be easier to give than Plex, especially if we're giving it long, long term plasma exchange. Um, I personally and my colleagues at Hopkins have really only used it in patients who have really severe disease that we can't control any other way. And so we'll try Plex as sort of a last ditch effort. And I think most of us think that it does sort of stabilize people for the short term, but it doesn't seem to be a very good long term solution. And it's never really, no, we've never gotten like a home run out of it um, in, the, in the cases where we've tried it, but we have really only tried it in the most severe cases. Okay, interesting. Um, and then one more question, if you don't yep. mind. Sure. Um, apart from statins, what are some of the other triggers um, discussed as causing uh, the anti-HMGCR myopathy? Oh, that's almost like a plant question. I wish I could have planted someone to ask that because I think it's a, <laughs> it has an interesting answer, which is um, it's just statins. But what's surprising is that statins are not just um, found in pills that get prescribed by your doctor to lower your cholesterol. So there are um, other supplements like red yeast rice, um, which people use to lower their cholesterol. But why do they use it? Well, it contains lovastatin, which is a, which is a statin. And there are um, diet, other dietary uh, extracts or other um, dietary supplements, I should say, that include things that have statins in them. And the, and the, Example that stuck with me the longest is uh, mushrooms. So there's a couple kinds of mushrooms that are used for um, cooking, one of which is oyster mushrooms. And oyster mushrooms, I forget, are like 1% to 2% lovastatin by dry weight. And so we have actually seen patients get um, develop anti-HMGCR myopathy um, from taking dietary supplements that include um, uh, extracts of dried, of dried mushrooms. So, um, so yeah, there, it is possible to get it from, from some, there's possible to get from something other than a pill. Um, but it's just the statin that's doing it as far as we know in these other agents. Great. Thank you. And in, in your presentation, I'm, I just, I promise this will be the last question. That's okay. I'm not going anywhere. It's like, uh, you know, okay. <laughs> this is the pandemic. I, I'm flexible, more flexible than usual. <laughs> we got lucky, guys. We've got him locked in his office with his headphones on. Exactly. Gonna... <laughs> Where am I going to go? Right. <laughs> uh, so what suggestions, uh, I know in your presentation, uh, you mentioned a new class of um, lower, cholesterol lowering. Are there other things available? So, yeah. So, I mean, in um, azetamibe is another thing, or zetia is another, you know, um, cholesterol lowering agent that as far as we know is safe in non HMGCR um, patients. And then um, again, these PCSK9 inhibitors are uh, this new class of drugs that we think uh, are pretty effective and safe in people who have um, anti HMGCR 
myopathy. But that's really, you know, I'm not a, I don't prescribe these cholesterol medications myself. Um, so these are things to go over, I think, usually in combination with your cardiologist or primary care physician, sort of bringing your myositis doctor into the loop and, and having them have a discussion about for your individual case, what's the safest and, and going to be the most effective for you. Karen wants to say thank you for an excellent, informative presentation. Oh, it was um, my pleasure. And like her, we're very appreciative of your time. Uh, did you have uh, anything else that you wanted to let us uh, let us know about or any final thoughts that you would like to give before we close out the webinar? Yeah, I mean, you know, just to let you know that we um, here at the NIH, we're, uh, we'd be interested to talk to you if you're interested in this clinical trial and also just interested uh, in seeing other patients with myositis where um, from this talk, it might seem like we're just focused on necrotizing myositis, but we're interested in IBM and dermatomyositis and um, all of our research depends on uh, people such as yourselves who come and visit and give us their time and, uh, you know, blood and, and tissue samples um, that really helps us move this field forward. So um, anybody who's interested in um, finding out more about participating in that way for any of the types of myositis, again, you can just email me at andrew.mammon at nh.gov and we'd be happy to, um, to work with you. Thank you. And we've included that email in the chat section. Great. So if you're attending, uh, you can certainly copy and paste that or save the chat, whatever uh, tool that you found has worked best for you. And uh, so thank, thank you so much, Dr. Mammon, for taking the time today and, and kind of explaining all of this to us and giving us this information and especially for answering our questions. Absolutely. And if you oh, see me no. around at any of these uh, meetings, don't be afraid to say hi. You heard my talk. And so it's nice. It's fun to meet people uh, in right. person too, which we, we don't get enough of these days, right? Oh, true. Oh, <laughs> but, uh, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully maybe not before not too long, I'll, I'll get a chance to meet some of you at a, at a meeting or something. Oh, we would love that. We would love oh. that. And we welcome you back anytime. Um, please just feel free if there's something you ever uh, think would be helpful for the sure. Myers community to learn. Um, just let us know and we'll make it happen. Okay, that's really, uh, that's really generous. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right, Dr. Mammon, thank you again for your time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Oh, and it's my pleasure. So thank you guys so much. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you.